So in this lecture, we talk about the regulation of political parties by the state. Um, the previous lecture on the white primary cases was trying to wrestle with the question as to whether party primaries are state action or the action of private associations. And so in those situations, you had uh, cases where the plaintiffs were usually voters or candidates suing a combination of the party and the state because the issue there was, well, who was acting? Was it a private association? Uh, was it the state? What is the political party? Uh, in most of the cases that we're going to discuss now, the party is itself suing the state, uh, and the party is trying to um, say that its First Amendment rights are being violated uh, by state regulations of its primary election or other functions. And so I think it's useful to sort of think about three different actors when you're talking about these cases, the individual, the state, and the political party, and to think about sort of, uh, you know, which which, uh, which agent is suing which. Um, and so uh, the party primary cases, like the white primary cases, it's the individual suing the state of the party. These cases, it's often the party uh, suing uh, the state. Uh, sometimes it's the party suing itself because it might be different parts of the party um, are disagreeing with other parts of the party in terms of the rules that apply uh, to primary elections. And so these cases, I think, are particularly fun because there's a question as to who is the state, um, because the state is usually controlled by one or both of the major parties. Uh, sometimes it might be the people through the initiative are enacting a law. And so it's not really the, you know, the elected official. It's not the party members who are elected, but it's just the, uh, the people themselves who are crafting these rules. Um, but as you start thinking about these First Amendment cases, you might want to ask, who is the party, right? What is it that we're talking about when we're talking about the First Amendment rights of a political party? Um, V.O. Key, the famous political scientist, uh, uh, divided up the party into three groups. He talked about um, the party in government, which are the elected officials of uh, that are Democrats and Republicans, you know, whether it's the president, Congress, state legislatures, that that's the party in government. There's the party in the electorate, which is most of us, you know, uh, who may end up uh, sort of only expressing our party preference uh, when we decide which primary election to vote in. Uh, but then there's the party organization, which is the sort of out of government group, which might include government officials, but something like the Democratic National Committee, the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee. These are the organizations that exist outside of government, um, but, you know, have a close uh, uh, hand in a lot of what government is doing and are certainly well connected to the people uh, in power. And so... Um, in each one of these cases, you might think of like, who is the party that we're talking about and who is the state? Uh, is the state one of the political parties that's trying to use the power uh, of state action to, um, to, to mess with the out, out of power party? Uh, is it the people acting through the initiative and which aspect of the party, the party in government, the party in the electorate um, or the party organization is the one that uh, is, is uh, relevant for the lawsuit? As a general rule, just to cut to the chase, the party organization is the kind of rights-bearing entity that the court is going to vest with the First Amendment rights that we'll be uh, discussing in these cases. And so the official organs of that organization will end up uh, being the plaintiffs who then sue to say that a state law, um, sometimes one that might even be supported by its own party, that, but that the state law um, was, is unconstitutional under uh, the First Amendment. And one, one thing that's, I think, interesting in these cases is to consider the possibility that a law in one state might be completely identical to a law in another state, but one might be unconstitutional, whereas the other one will be seen as constitutional because the unconstitutional law is one that the party never agreed to. But whereas the, if the parties do agree to the law um, in the state, well, then that uh, is consistent with their uh, First Amendment rights. It's only when they start to disagree with it that may, they can launch a lawsuit um, to strike it down. So there are many cases that have gone to the Supreme Court uh, dealing with what we call party autonomy. I'll just mention a few here. Um, several of these cases deal with the question of whether a, political, a state can prevent a political party from opening itself up or closing itself off from voters. And so in 1986, there was this case called Tashian versus Republican Party of Connecticut. 
in that case, the law in Connecticut said that a um, party could not open itself up to independent voters, that they it was a, what was known as a closed primary. And so um, the, the state had to, the, the party um, couldn't try to expand its base by saying, all right, non-party members like independents could vote in our primary. Court said that that violated the First Amendment rights of the Republican Party there that would try to open itself up, uh, particularly maybe to make itself more attractive and uh, appeal to a broader audience. Court said that the party has a First Amendment right uh, to open itself up. Similarly, in California Democratic Party versus Jones, the court said that a party has a right to close itself off. Uh, in that case, which I'll describe in uh, uh, greater length later, um, the party, uh, the, the state law passed by initiative said that um, any party, any person could vote in any party's primary for any office. And the court said that that violated the First Amendment rights of the political party. Interestingly, while the you the the court has said that a party can open itself up to independence. It said that it doesn't have a constitutional right to open itself up to um, non-party voters, so that the Democrats do not necessarily have a constitutional right to open themselves up uh, to Republicans. And there was this case called Clingman versus Beaver, which is a very complicated case in 2005, which led to a fractured opinion. But the bottom line there was that at least when it comes to libertarian or sort of small parties, that then uh, they don't have a constitutional right to object to a state law that said that they couldn't open themselves up to say the Democrats, Republicans, or other party members. Uh, and so that while they may have the right to open themselves up to independence under Tashian versus Republican Party of Connecticut, and they can close themselves off um, under California Democratic Party versus Jones, they don't necessarily have the right to open themselves up to people who've explicitly affiliated uh, with a different party. There are many other cases that have reached the Supreme Court which deal with the question of party autonomy. Let me just mention uh, two here. The first is uh, Democratic Party U.S. versus Wisconsin X. Rel. LaFollette in 1981. In that case, uh, the question was whether the National Party Convention could uh, exclude delegates from a state which ran an open primary which allowed non-party members to vote. And the court sided with the national party against what would have been the state party or the state law, saying that a national party has the First Amendment right to decide that people who are elected under a more open system uh, don't have the right to be represented in the national party convention, which would choose the president. Much later, uh, during the Roberts court, we have this case, Washington State Grange versus Washington State Republican Party also raises these First Amendment questions of uh, sort of how the party can protect its brand. Uh, and in that case, um, the, the state of Washington ran a uh, nonpartisan primary, which allowed uh, uh, different candidates to express a party preference. So while there wasn't a uh, party primary in the traditional sense, if I were to run for the, say, Republican primary, or if I were to run for the primary, I could say I am a Republican and say that is my party preference. And the court said, uh, even though the party might not have consented to me expressing that preference, that um, it is constitutional, that law that allows me to run in that nonpartisan primary election with that party label that expresses my preference is okay, so long as it's clear that this is just my party preference, but I'm not saying that I'm actually affiliated with the political party at issue. So up to now, I've mentioned different types of primary election systems, but I think it's useful to at least put them on the table to describe um, different types of primary elections and what the constitutional uh, questions are involved with each. So uh, if you look at the at Tashian, the case that said um, uh, the Republican Party in Connecticut could open itself up to independence, what was at issue there was a closed primary. In a closed primary, only voters who have registered with a party uh, in advance are able to participate in a primary. And so only Democrats can vote in the Democratic Party, Republicans in the Republican Party, Greens in the Green Party, Libertarians in the Libertarian Party. Uh, and you can't cross over into another party's primary. Then you have, in some states, what's known as a semi-closed primary, which is like the closed primary, except that new or unaffiliated voters, such as independents, can choose to vote uh, in the parties on the uh, in that party's primary ballot. But they have to commit to voting in either the Democrat or Republican Party's uh, primary or another party. And so the uh, independent or unaffiliated voters decide 
uh, to vote for one of the in one of the party's primaries, but not out of party uh, members. So so something like the Republicans would then in a semi closed primary not be able to vote in the Democratic primary and vice versa. Third, we have different versions of what are known as open primaries. As a general rule, an open primary allows any voter to vote in any party's primary for that entire ballot. And so I could decide on primary election day, do I want to vote in the Democratic primary? Do I want to vote in the Republican primary? Do I want to vote in the Libertarian primary? And the like. And so um, th there are many different variants on this. And this sort of gives you a sense of how complicated sometimes these primary election rules can be. In some states, the voter chooses the ballot in secret in the voting booth. So you just go into the voting booth, you haven't told anyone you're you're a Democrat or Republican, uh, and you just say, all right, I'm gonna vote in this party's primary election. In others, the voter must request publicly that a certain ballot um, be given to them by officials at the polls. So you come in and you declare that you are um, uh, gonna vote in the Democratic or Republican primary or an, another party primary, uh, but any voter is allowed to make that declaration. And in other states uh, that allow for party registration, really up until primary election day, it's functionally the same thing because you can go into the polling place and say, today I'm a Republican, today I'm a Democrat, and then you uh, will vote in that party's primary election. Many different states have many different rules when it comes to these open primaries, um, but each in each one, the common denominator is that any voter can vote in any party's complete primary ballot uh, on that election day. That's different than a blanket primary. That was at, uh, at issue in California Democratic Party versus Jones. In a blanket primary, a uh, voter is able to uh, vote in any party's primary for any office. So what that means is that you could vote, say, for the Democratic Party for governor, in the Democratic primary for governor, Republican primary for state senator, uh, the Green Party's uh, primary for state House of Representatives. And as you go down the ballot, you can decide which party's primary you're going to vote in. Critically, the, it is still the case that um, the parties are going to have their own location, their own name and position on the general election ballot. And these votes that are tallied in the blanket primary are going to be dispositive as to which candidates emerge as the primary, uh, the party's nominee on the general election ballot. But that, that is what allows, say, non-party members uh, to, to switch parties as they go down the, the, the ballot in order to affect the outcome of who the party's nominee is. Finally, uh, let me just mention nonpartisan primaries that now exist in California, um, Louisiana, Washington, and some other places. And these are just sort of similar to like the student council elections that you uh, confronted in, in high school or middle school. And that is uh, you start with an election with many candidates and then you winnow it down to two uh, and or, or a few. And a nonpartisan primary election could have party labels on the ballot, as was true in Washington State Grange or party preferences, um, but it doesn't have to. And it's it's essentially like a general election and a runoff. And so um, it, it doesn't necessarily implicate the party's First Amendment rights because you've tried to take parties out of the process. So the eventual uh, nominees uh, at the uh, that make their way onto the general election ballot could be two Republicans, two Democrats, one Republican, one Democrat, minor party candidates. It's just that whoever got whichever two candidates got the most votes uh, in the primary election. Since California Democratic Party versus Jones is uh, the most emphatic statement of the party's First Amendment rights uh, in with respect to primaries, it's worth spending a moment discussing it. As I mentioned before, that's the case that struck down California's blanket primary, which was passed by an initiative. Turns out a majority of Democratic and Republican voters actually supported this initiative. Um, but what it did is it forced the parties to allow any, can, any party, uh, any member uh, or, or non-member of a political party, any voter could vote in any party's primary uh, for any office. As they went down the ballot, they could switch from one party primary to the next. And whoever won these uh, blanket primaries would end up being the party's nominee on the general election ballot. And so why did California voters pass a law like this? Well, in part, if you think that the, the political parties and the nominees are way too extreme, one way to uh, try to moderate them might be to force them to have uh, out-of-party members 
uh, or non-party members to come in and vote in that primary. So you might think if the Republicans could vote in the uh, Democratic Party primary if they wanted to, that then you'd get uh, some candidates who would emerge who might end up being um, more middle of the road, same with uh, allowing independents to vote uh, in those primaries. And so the state had several justifications, which was one, enhancing representation, meaning that you know independents and moderate voters are often left out of the process. And so allowing them to vote in parties' primaries would be critical uh, to, to representing those voters, especially given that party primaries end up being the dispositive election so much of the time. Secondly, that it would expand debate, right? That you'd have different kinds of, of candidates in different parties' primaries because they might appeal uh, to more moderate voters. Uh, similarly, just in terms of enhancing representation, there would also be, as they said, enfranchisement of the disenfranchised insofar as independent voters have no place to go when it comes to um, party primaries. They would have a role to play in a, party, in a blanket primary election where they could then uh, vote in what are often the most dispositive election. Uh, promoting fairness is also something uh, that was behind this law, uh, the advocates said, to make sure that every voter was able to vote in every party's uh, primary. It also afforded greater choice, increased uh, participation, and protected privacy because it meant that you uh, didn't have to declare that you were voting in one party's primary or another because as you went down the ballot, you could choose to vote in the Democratic Party's primary for one office, Republican Party primary for another. So the court looked at those state interests and in many respects found them to be sort of inherently violative of the First Amendment uh, because the whole goal of the blanket primary was to moderate the parties, to change the types of candidates who would emerge from them, and in a sense, redefine the association so that it would include non-party members. And so if you think the Democrats and Republicans and other parties are like private bowling clubs uh, or other kinds of private association, it's like saying to the Boy Scouts that they have to accept Girl Scouts, right? That that seems to cut to the uh, heart of what the association is. And so um, the court under the, the balancing test that we saw from Timmins and, and Anderson finds this to be a severe deprivation of their First Amendment rights. Uh, because it adulterates the candidate selection process, as Justice Scalia's majority opinion says, this is the crucial juncture, juncture at which the appeal to common principles may be translated into concerted action. It presents a clear and present danger to the basic function of a political party, which is to choose its standard bearer. And if the state wanted to come back with uh, a more narrowly tailored uh, primary system that didn't infringe on party rights, well, it could adopt the nonpartisan primary, which is actually what California eventually did for most offices. And so California Democratic Party versus Jones is the most sort of full-throated expression of uh, the First Amendment rights of political parties, and it stands as a significant barrier to state efforts to try to moderate the parties by messing with the party primary system.